This is Point of Inquiry for Friday, December 7th, 2007. Welcome to Point of Inquiry. I'm DJ Grothy. Point of Inquiry is the radio show, the podcast of the Center for Inquiry, a think tank advancing science, reason, and secular values in public affairs. Before we get to this week's interview, which was recorded live at the recent conference in New York entitled The Secular Society and Its Enemies, uh, here's a word from this week's sponsor, Free In. It's a pleasure for me to have Richard Dawkins back on Point of Inquiry. This interview was recorded a few weeks ago, and it's the first time we recorded an interview live in front of a large audience. A little background on Richard Dawkins. He's professor of the public understanding of science at Oxford University and the recipient of a number of awards for his writing on science, including the Royal Society of Literature Award and the L.A. Times Literary Prize. He's also been awarded the Royal Society Michael Faraday Award for the furtherance of the public understanding of science. In a poll recently in the United Kingdom, he was named Britain's leading public intellectual. He's the author of a number of critically acclaimed books, influential books, such as The Selfish Gene, The Blind Watchmaker, and one of my favorites, Unweaving the Rainbow. So here is the interview with Richard Dawkins. Welcome to Point of Inquiry again, Professor Richard Dawkins. It's a great pleasure to be on Point of Inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> I used to think, uh, Professor, that atheist books... Call well, me Richard, please. Uh, Richard. Uh, used to think, Richard, that atheist books just didn't sell. And with the recent titles, and especially your book, A Million uh, Point Five uh, co- Copies Sold Around the World, we realize that's just not true. Atheist books do sell. Let me ask you to start off, have you discovered that uh, now's the cultural moment for everyone to just wake up and say, aha, I get it, God's a delusion? My literary agent, John Brockman, is no fool, and he, uh, where it comes to business in the book world, and he told me about seven years ago when I first broached the possibility of writing The God Delusion, he said, don't do it. Um, You might be able to sell that book in Britain, but you'll never sell it in America. Uh, and for all I know, and the implication of your question is, yes, that he was right, uh, that maybe seven years ago you couldn't sell a book like that in America. Uh, now you clearly can. You kindly quoted sales figures, which are uh, very encouraging. Um, and by the way, added to that, those sales in English, uh, it's being published in 31 foreign languages, which has never happened to me before in any of my books. I mean, I've been up in the 20s, but never, never. (laughs) Um, So it looks as though something has happened. One of the speakers on an earlier panel today fingered 9-11 as a possible turning point in this culture war. And I think that's highly plausible. Certainly, my immediate reaction was to stand up. I mean, I sort of felt uh, my, my first reaction was to quote John F. Kennedy and, and say, you know, we, we are all Americans now. Uh, and then I participated in, a, in an evening event in a London theatre where writers were invited to go and respond to it. And I said something rather similar. I felt we're, we're, we are now at war. But I didn't think of it as being at war with Islam. I thought of it as being at war with um, I forget whether at that time I thought of it as fundamentalist religion mm. or just, just, I think I probably thought of it as religion, actually, although, of course, I wouldn't be so naive as not to see that there's a difference between uh, extremist fundamentalist religion and the sort of moderate religion which uh, the, the, the majority of the religious people that I meet in Britain, at least, espouse. Um, but I did feel that, we, that this, is, this is the start of a, of a new phase in this culture war and uh, I th- that that was why I, I suggested to my literary agent that I wanted to, to, to write this book it was about yes about seven, seven years mm-hmm. ago and that time he said no don't don't do it um, and and then I wrote another book which was um, 
the ancestor's tale, and uh, which was pure science. Uh, and then after that, I, I reverted to the point. And then at, at that time, my literary agent, John Brockman, said, yes, now go for it. Uh, you, you, now, now's the time. It, that could have been because by then we'd had, what, six years of Bush. And, and that, that might have been what, what swung him round. So in one sense, your book, uh, the success that, is, that it is, it's responding to a cultural moment. But you're also aiming, it seems to me, to create a cultural moment from the book. It's something of a phenomenon. People are uh, uh, motivated by it to kind of change the way they're doing things, to get more involved. And you're now organizing something of a movement around uh, the attention that the book's received. I have started a website, uh, richarddawkins.net. I've started two charities, uh, one in Britain and one in America. Uh, the, the primary aim is what I call consciousness raising, and if you want me to s say more about that later, I, I will. Um, one of the most recent parts of that consciousness raising campaign is what we call the Out Campaign, uh, which you can see on, on the website. And it really is uh, kind of modeled on the, on the gay mm. pride movement, which was so successful. Out means, among other things, come out. Come out of the closet. Uh, I think one of the main things, and I've said this so many times that I'm kind of fear fearful that people are getting bored with hearing me say it, that, that uh, I, I may naively have thought that the book had a good chance of converting devout religious people to, to atheism. I'm not sure that that's realistic. What does seem to be happening, and Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris report the same thing, is an enormous upsurge in uh, people who are already sort of atheists or kind of haven't, perhaps haven't thought about it very much, but are uh, not at least not very not very religious, having their consciousness raised to the point that they, that they realise actually I am an atheist, and apparently lots of other people are too, and I never realised it. So uh, all three of us, uh, who the, the ones I mentioned, have found as we went around the United States giving talks, presenting our books, we got terrific receptions wherever we went. If anything, I found the, the most enthusiastic receptions I got in the Bible Belt. Mm. Uh, and it was as though people, and, and indeed people said this to me explicitly uh, afterwards, people were... Uh, were shown that they were not alone. They thought they were, and they suddenly found themselves standing up, literally standing up in a standing ovation in many, ca in many cases, looking around and seeing a, a room full, a huge hall full of people in the Bible Belt. Uh, and they never realized that there were lots of other people mm. like them. So I think that's the most important thing that we're, that, that, that we're doing. It's, it's, it's raising consciousness, uh, encouraging atheists to come out of the closet and to stand up and be counted, stand up, look each other in the eye, recognize that, that, that they are surrounded by other people of, of like mind. Mm -hmm. uh, politically speaking, I sh should be a little bit cautious because I'm not a citizen of this country, but I get the, the feeling that uh, the, the widespread acceptance of the fact that you cannot become elected to public office if you're an, an, if you're an atheist is something that could be changed by an effective lobbying movement mm. because far smaller lobbies than ours, at least than our potential one, are e enormously successful in lobbying politicians. There are some causes that n no politician would, would dream of offending uh, because they know they would lose the so-and-so vote. Uh, Nobody seems to be afraid of losing the atheist vote. <laughs> and I think that, I mean, we're far more numerous than, than some of these other lobbies. I think that that's uh, something that just requires some organization. And of course, atheists are notoriously hard to organize, but, um, which is a tribute to us. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I,